so to understand muscular technique first we need to uh, understand the history so chronic osteomyelitis as an entity per se uh, it's it's pretty ancient right first described described way back by hippocrates and this is resistant to most treatments now why because um, any infection within the bone it's difficult for the uh, blood to reach that because whatever antibiotics we give either oral or iv which which reaches into the blood circulation not enough quantity goes into the bone so hence tackling this particular infections is always difficult it's always a challenge whenever we have an osteomyelitis of the bone right so it uh gives a huge burden on the patient now uh, they undergo multiple procedures uh taking a lot of money as well as spending a lot of time they're not able to get back to your work ultimately even many of them ending up in amputation okay i'm not I'm not talking of non units i'm talking of only osteomyelitis as of now okay so that's what uh, peter jernard uh, is who is one of the authorities on infections in bone spoke that we can only tell that a treatment is successful or a patient has undergone remission from infection if after even after 12 months there is no signs and symptoms right it can take that long that's all we need to remember the main stay of treatment is and will always be a surgical debridement now as long as dead necrotic tissues are there within the uh, within the body within the bone or whatever uh, infection eradication is next to impossible so that stays the mainstay now they, uh, no matter where we, what we are talking about whether it is a joint whether it is spine whether it is a bone is the same thing okay so there are multiple techniques now this is more from theoretical question when, when they ask if the technique available for treatment of chronic osteomyelitis it was asked i think a uh, couple of years back in uh, dnb final exams so just 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 to remind all of us so a new technique what is it it is an op- it's also called an open air technique in the sense we debride we do a stage bone grafting we debride we leave it open okay and then do a stage bone grafting and leave it open and expect granulation to pop up for that and then ultimately we can do a skin grafting that's the pepinu technique then came the mcnally technique or belfast technique as we call it here also radical debridement is the mainstay but an early soft tissue coverage and bone grafting is delayed okay then the lotenbog uh, which is again a very very common in process nowadays of so a continuous and austere ir- irrigation technique that fluids are sent with sometimes mixed with antibiotics so continuous suction irrigation is happening within the canal that uh, reduces the uh, bacterial load within the canal and uh, enhances chances of uh, eradication of infection right and then we have this muscular technique which is the induced membrane technique so both are one and the same in exam they may ask you induced membrane technique or muscular technique both are same now this was described way back in 2000 right so this was the paper where muscle originally described it and to be noted is that this was this article was in french and hence uh it did not uh i mean not many surgeons across the world were able to take note of that or were able to follow that okay in uh this article which is initially published by him in 2000 uh, he had described his work all the way from 1985 to 1999 that's 14 years of uh, hard work and compilation okay it was only when he presented his work in the american academy meeting in 2002 he was advised by uh, some of the american surgeons to publish his findings in the english journal so that it can get worldwide acceptability and more and more surgeons start doing this okay and that's where he published in 2003 in a not so famous journal again um, but he was able to publish it in uh, in english and that's where it was taken noted and now all over everyone uh, i mean many of the surgeons do this okay so what he had originally described was for treatment of uh, open fractures having bone defects so whenever there is an open fracture and there is a bone loss how do we tackle that that's where he had employed this particular technique but subsequently it has been extrapolated to other indications as well okay so in his series original series of 2000 uh, in which year, uh, year in which he had published he had described about 35 patients with bone loss ranging from 5 cm to 24 cm okay uh, both upper limb as well as lower limb and uh, flap coverage was in 28 out of the 35 patients 
okay and all of them so they had 100% success rate at 4 months now that was the beauty about this particular technique that the success rate is significantly high compared to any other thing now imagine a 24 cm bone loss you were able to treat with this particular technique okay it's pretty um, great result one may say okay so the rationale of the methodology as per as per his understanding was that you put in a cement spacer the cement spacer uh, has a lot of different roles the main role is it prevents encroachment of the soft tissues within the uh, within the bone loss area okay so what happens if you have a bone loss we have the proximal segment the loss segment in between and we have the distal segment now the loss segment there is no bone so all the soft tissues can start encroaching on that and then we all know that if there is an interposition of soft tissues between the bones the bones never heal right so so the cement spacer prevents that because now cement is occupying that space and the soft tissue cannot encroach any area so that was the intention of putting the cement spacer and uh, when he went in the second stage he he noticed a membrane which was formed around the cement okay and he did not remove the membrane because of the rational that whenever he tried to remove the membrane this membrane was very well adherent to the muscles and the fascia so what he uh, noticed is uh, if he tried to remove the membrane there was excessive bleeding within there which uh, no surgeon would want and hence he left the membrane in and put in bone graft within the membrane okay and his rational was that when you put a cement spacer inside the body uh any any anything inside uh, uh a, a person the body of a person which is not his own there will be a foreign body response to the right and how does the foreign body response happen because when you are doing the initial surgery there will be hematoma around the foreign body this uh will lose cause loose extracellular matrix that will cause granulation tissue this will be neovascularized now this is the regular form of stages of healing right so you could see granulation tissue neovascularization all are form of uh, regular inflammatory response of the body and since there is a foreign body there there will be a fibrous capsule which is trying to encapsulate the foreign body that's the natural phenomenon of any uh, foreign body within the within uh, a person's milieu right so this is what happens and there will be a uh, thick fibrous capsule around that okay and as per muscle the advantages of putting uh, just incising the membrane not excising it not removing it is of course along with uh, reduced uh, bleeding during the second stage now you have a like a contained defect into which uh, bone graft could be packed and once that is done you could suture the capsule on that's the membrane on that so now it is uh, supporting the graft inside so that it doesn't disperse uh, here and there and uh there will be further new vascularization to the graft so this is what was thought and uh, he published this series okay so essentially if you look into this it is taking a defense mechanism of body into advantage to treat this now what is the defense mechanism whenever there is a foreign body within that the body tries to encapsulate it and shield it and try to push it out but it can't be pushed out because there is skin coverage so the encapsulation which has neovascularity is helping uh, the second stage of uh, when, when we pack it with bone graft okay and it is a length independent technique that means whether the defect is 1 cm 10 cm or 25 cm the technique remains the same that you debride properly uh, fill the entire space with the cement and second stage inside the entire membrane and take out the cement and put in the graft to the entire length so it's a length independent technique and in this series gaps up to 25 cm were successfully treated okay subsequently other surgeons have done uh, much more than that also but this was the recording okay further on when other surgeons started uh, employing the same technique they added little more recommendations of their own the biggest recommendation was by peter jornis again in who, who told that when we are uh, doing the second stage we should not be impacting the bone graft right because usually in, in any non unions what we do is we try to do an impaction bone grafting so that there is a nice scaffold um, nice uh, uh, tightly packed bone uh, structure which can heal but this is to be avoided when we are doing the second stage in a muscular technique because if you are trying to impact it the titus itself can cause necrosis of the graft okay so this was uh, a recommendation given and then uh, one more recommendation was what do we do when we have bigger large defects now when you have large defects obviously uh, autograft will not be good enough um, will not be sufficient enough so we can mix autografts and allografts in the ratio of 1 is to 3 uh, by volume okay so that's that's those two recommendations were just added on little later 2011 and 2012 so uh, autograft we could take it from uh, iliac crest proximal tibia 
and now we have uh, the ria which is the rimer irrigator aspirator technique of in which 